and welcome everybody. Uh, uh, I call this Welcome to Herbs, Growing, Enjoying, and Preserving Herbs. Maybe it should be Herbs 101. We've got a little less than an hour to get through the presentation, so I do go through it quick. Um, today, we are going to cover, of course, herbs. There is a disclaimer that I will read. The history and lore of herbs. Herbs versus spices. What's the difference? Uses for herbs. Growing herbs in containers. How to select your plants. What requirements you need. The soil as opposed to dirt. And I will explain that in a little bit. Uh, the soil that you should use and herbal preparations. I will not read every slide in its entirety. There are a few that I will cover in more depth, but this one I will read in its entirety. In our discussion today, we will go over uses of herbs, which will include herbs that have been used for medicinal purposes. This is not medical advice. Please do not take it as such. This is purely an inclusion of information of how herbs have been used in history. Do not use herbs. Do not use herbs without checking first and foremost with your doctor and or a qualified herbalist. To be clear, do not mistake any portion of this workshop for medical advice. I'm not a doctor, I only play one on TV. Herbs go back as far as human history records it. The Chinese were the earliest written herbal study. There are huge, huge um, historical tombs written on Chinese herbal medicine. India, the Vedics wrote literature approximately 15 to 1200 BC. The Greeks, they had a huge compendium. The Romans, there's 37 volumes to theirs. And um, in the Middle Ages, monks grew medicinal herbs in their monasteries. The liquor Benedictine, which I'll go over briefly later on, um, of course, comes from that order of the Benedictine monks, made at the Benedictine Abbey of Fecamp in Normandy. Native Americans, here's an interesting one. Their use of herbs went back eons but the Native Americans did not have a written history until the Europeans started colonizing the United States. Um, so theirs is an oral history. And I don't know if you've ever been to a an Indian reservation. They are amazing when they tell their stories because it's all stories that have been passed down and they only have the oral history. So you can get little snippets and bits of information. Since they have begun recording um, in the written word, there is a lot more information about North American herbs, but um, just wanted to put that little snippet in there for you. Uh, interesting fact, today the World Health Organization estimates that 80% of people rely on herbal medicines for some part of their primary health care. Now in the United States, it's not that large a number, but if you travel outside the United States, other countries have uh, dependency on their uh, herbal preparations. Uh, the little note that I put in there is 70% of German physicians prescribe plant-based medicines. The Scandinavians, the Japanese, the Chinese, they all rely very heavily on their herbal pharmacies. So, in the United States, we do have herbologists or herbalists. I like to say herbologists, a little nod to Harry Potter. Um, but you can scope out some professional ones to get information on that. And there are some, you know, really interesting things that you can look up online. If you do that online, just make sure you're getting correct information. Always check with a certified herbalist. An herb by any other name, what is the difference between herbs and spices. <clears throat> herbs are basically the leafy part of the plant. Spices is everything else. Now herbs can be grown here um, in North America. They also come from the Mediterranean area, Asia, European, all over the place, but generally it's the leafy part. If you're using other things like flower buds, bark, roots, berries, seeds, um, stigmas of crocuses, that's where um, Saffron, I'm trying to get the right word. That's where saffron comes from. They are considered spices. Having said that, we do use pieces of the plant and refer to it as an herbal remedy. Technically, 
it is a spice. But just so you're not confused here, what we're pretty much discussing today are herbs, and that would be the leafy part of the plant. Medicinal herbs and spices. When you are growing herbs for medicinal purposes, and when you're growing herbs for ingestion, even if you're just using it to flavor your foods, you want to make sure that they're grown in ideal rather than marginal conditions. You want the best possible growing situation. And the reason I say this is because you are going to put those herbs into your body. So you don't want anything foreign introduced into the herb. The herbs will leach up chemicals. It will respond to the soil that you're using. It will respond to the conditions that it's grown in. And then you're going to ingest it. So you want the absolute best growing conditions. Um, organic growers say that the best growing conditions are those that closely approximate wild conditions. Um, yeah, I tend to agree with that. And our gardens can be made to do that. We had a workshop uh, several years ago with the master gardeners and the gentleman that presented the workshop, it was on herbs, suggested that Mediterranean herbs, which is herbs from the Mediterranean area, would grow better if you put white sand on top of the soil that they are growing in. And the reason for this is Mediterranean herbs are used to growing in humid days, but very dry, cooler nights. Those are not the conditions that we have in and around Delaware. Our nights tend to stay humid and they stay, stay in, ugh, they tend to stay warm and muggy. So uh, years ago, we had major problems with fusillium wilt. And that's a disease that affects a lot of herbs, but basil primarily. People were losing basil plants left and right to fusillium wilt. One of the reasons for that were was the fact that it was very humid at night and that uh, that fusillium wilt likes to grow in humid conditions. So doing this with the sands in the bottom, what happens is the sun comes down, reflects off that sand and dries the bottom of the leaves so that as you go into the night, the leaves are drier and they tend to grow better. I do have a list of Mediterranean herbs. It is broken down into um, what grows best in moist and what grows best in dry climates. So if you would like that list, just jot that down, send me the email and I will send it out to you. Um, herbs, typically before there was a huge factory push to grow herbs, uh, were grown in the home in home gardens. Um, spices, were also grown in home gardens and greenhouses. A lot of the um, well-to-do people, especially back in, back in colonial times, would have hothouses, greenhouses, where they grew things that couldn't be grown, um, you know, in our winters. So a lot of herbal remedies and things came out of gardens. Now, you know, the growth, the harvest, the processing of herbs, it's very labor intensive. So we have large companies that do it. You always wanna make sure that you're getting your herbs from a reliable source. Don't just pick any source on the internet to order them from. You want to ask a lot of questions. And I will bring that up a couple of times. You always wanna ask questions, especially if it is something you were putting into your body. The same thing goes for essential oils. Essential oils are the oils that we get from herbs. That's how herbs get their flavor. There are oils in the leaves. To that point, when you are collecting herbs, the best time to collect your herbs is early in the morning. As the sun beats down on the herb, it tends to force those oils out of the leaves. So if you collect later in the day, you have less of a flavor. You're still gonna have the flavor of the herb, but it will be more flavorful if you can get it earlier in the day. Um, there's different ways that we can get oils out of different herbs, and there are, you know, different methods for doing that. I'm going to go over them, you know, briefly in this presentation. One I wanted to point out were mints. 
There's a lot of different mints and it does represent the largest essential oil crop in the United States. Dill is also another very important oil crop. Um, and you would know that if you like pickles, used heavily in the production of pickles. Uses for herbs are myriad. There are so many uses for herbs, culinary, medicinal, liquor, one of my favorites, um, religion, magic, and that is spelt two ways because the ancient spelling of magic was with CK. Herbs can be used in pest control. Um, that's why we have um, companion planting. Uh, companion planting is a great way to use herbs to control pests around your house. I know many people that plant mint around their homes and they plant it by the foundation. And that is because ants hate mint and it tends to deter them from coming into the house. Uh, disinfectants, which have become inordinately popular over the last year. Uh, and unfortunately I've noticed in the stores that a lot of the herbal disinfectants that used to be out there aren't produced very heavily anymore. They're just trying to get what they can out on the shelves, but uh, they are starting to slowly come back and those are essential oils being put into those disinfectants. Herbs are also used for clothes dyes. Um, they're used for fish food and, um, you know, beauty products, a lot of lavender and beauty products. I have a lot of information here on alcohol and liqueurs. We're not going to go into this in depth. For a couple of years, <clears throat> excuse me, for a couple of years now, I have been working on a workshop that basically is, do you know where your liquor comes from? And this is just a blurb and a nod to that fact that many, 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 if not just about all of them, come from some form of plant. Uh, vodka comes from potatoes. And, you know, if you look into the production of liquor, it's all distilled from plant-based materials. Anisette is an anise flavored liqueur. It's very popular in the Mediterranean area. Um, in Greece, they have uzu. They, the countries around the Mediterranean do use a lot of anisette in their liqueurs. Um, beer, beer comes from cereal grains, most commonly from malted barley and are mostly, well, most of the large commercially produced beers are brewed with hops. With a lot of the microbreweries coming out, uh, they tend to back away from hops and they're using other things to flavor their beers and give it a distinct flavor. But hops are the predominant uh, other grain or herb that is used for the production of beer. Hops was the herb of the year in 2018. Um, really big thing about hops is that they are very um, attractive to butterflies. Butterflies love hops. The University of Delaware started a program where they were growing hops. I have not checked into that program since I knew that it was started. I haven't gotten over there, but I heard it was doing really well. So I'd like to get over there and check that out again. Um, Benedictine, I mentioned it before with the Benedictine monks. That liqueur contains 27 herbs, 21 which are known and six they won't ever tell anybody. Cream de mint is a mint. Drambuie, herbs and spices, tons of them. It's a scotch whiskey. Uh, elderberry wine. There's a lot of wines that come from that, but I mentioned elderberry wine because that was very popular. Last year, there was a huge draw for elderberries because it is um, considered to be uh, used in medicine against colds. That's all I'll say. Um, Galliano has 30 different herbs in it. Gin is made basically uh, from juniper berries. The base for gin is actually vodka, and then it's flavored with juniper berries. If you ever see a juniper tree, if you see those little gray silverish berries on it, if you put one in your hand and crush it and smell it, you will smell what smells like gin. Goldschlager, now gold is not an herb. <laughs> gold leaf, they put real gold leaf into Goldschlager, but the cinnamon that's in that is definitely an herb. Jägermeister includes 56 different herbs. 
strega, 70 different herbs. Um, and Sambuca, again, an anise flavored um, drink that comes from the Mediterranean area. As I said, we weren't going to go into this in detail. I just wanted to cover those so you had an idea of what herbs are used for when it comes to alcohol. I cover growing herbs in containers a lot. And the reason I cover it is because that is the way most of us tend to grow herbs. It's also a very convenient way to grow herbs. I also do a workshop on growing herbs in a nine hole strawberry container. If you've ever seen them, they are kind of an oval shape and they have the holes in the side and they were originally designed so that you could grow strawberries. When I moved into my house, we had one sitting on the side over by the garage and I didn't know what to do for it with it and I was gonna get rid of it. But I discovered online that people plant those with all different kinds of herbs and they just grow it out. And if you put that by your back door, right by your kitchen, you can just go out there and snip herbs as you go along and you have them right by your door. Instead of you know deciding to grow the garden there, you've got your nine hole. My nephew came up with a name for it and he called it my Thanksgiving pot. The reason for that being is I figured there's so many herbs in there that I didn't want to go to waste over the winter. So I, I would cut the herb back and I would use them to stuff my turkey. And it, it does come out really nice, but that's why he called it the Thanksgiving pot. So growing herbs in containers, you have to think about several different things. You have to think about what you're growing, go, huh, what you're going to grow. And when I say that, I'll cover it more, but you want to make sure that you have herbs that are requiring the same things, the same light, the same moisture, the same feeding. And like I said, we'll go into that a little bit in deeper, but you also want to think about when you're planting a container, the seedling versus the adult plant. You are going to get an adult plant. So if you crowd the pot, you're going to have to take something out. Or you're gonna have problems with your other plants. You also wanna think about what type of pot there are herbs that most herbs grow best in clay pots. They just do. It's because it dries the clay, pulls the water out, and it dries it out, and therefore gives you that dryness you're looking for uh, overnight. If you use plastic, you, uh, you have to be careful about uh, too much water, and the water does not evaporate as quickly, so you'll have a moist area. There are some herbs that do very well in moist um, climates. You just have to know what you're planting and where you're planting it. And of course, wood. You can use wood, uh, but you run into similar problems with the moisture content. So you really want to review the herbs that you're going to grow, and you want to know what requirements they have as far as containers. Seedlings and cuttings and plants. Oh my. So there's different ways that you can start your herb plants. And the first way is seedlings. You can just take some seeds, put it in planting soil, grow them under grow lights, and voila, you have plants. Now there are pros and cons to that. If you're going to grow seedlings, you have to think about those. Growing seedlings is time consuming, the planting, the organizing, the monitoring of them. It does take up space, and you need to have the space for the grow lights, the tables, and the seed containers. It's labor intensive. There's a lot of work involved in doing seedlings, but there's a lot of great reward as well. It's also not a sure thing. There's an, uh, you know, every type of seed has a germination rate and you can go anywhere from 70 to 90, 70 to 100%, uh, approximately 90% is the average. You also, you know, it's seed viability. Is the seed new? Is it older? Did it come from a reputable source and not reputable source? What's the weather going to be like? Are you growing them inside or outside? Are your seeds going to suffer from disease? There's a seed disease, a seedling disease called um, damping, off. damping off. Thank yeah. you, damping off. That's yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, basically, your thank you. Your seed is growing, and all of a sudden, it just bloop, it goes right down. Um, you know, you run into these problems is what I'm trying to say. So the pros of that is it's inexpensive. You know, a packet of seeds is $3.95. Uh, it's peace of mind. You know what soil was used. You know 
if you've used fertilizer and if so what type of plant food was used so you know the things that are going into the herbs and you know what's going to go into your body the second way is cuttings you have to think about cuttings and in the bottom right i show you that picture there are many herbs that you can take cuttings of and you can start them in water Again, I have a list of plants that are, uh, of herbs that do well if you start them in water. And I can provide you that list if you want. Jot that down, send me an email. Um, cuttings, you need time to propagate them. Viability, not all cuttings come uh, to fruition. A lot of them may die and you don't know why they died, they just did. You also need space for this. You're going to need grow lights. You're going to need containers, as you see there on the bottom right. And again, it's not a sure thing. Cuttings can be inexpensive. With the initial outlay for, gosh, you know, you could use empty jars and you could just put them on your windowsill, um, or you can go a little bit more high tech with grow lights and tables and jars that all match, you know. It, but Technically, you can get them inexpensively. And it is peace of mind, again, with the food that's used and the fertilizer that you put into it. You know exactly what's going into your food. The uh, other way of doing it is buying plants that are already established. That can be expensive. It runs into a lot of money to buy plants. You know, um, there are certain places you can get them for $1.99. You can also spend upwards of $3.95, $4.95, $5.95, depending on where you go. You don't know how they've been grown. You don't know if they're, you know, what fertilizer's been used, what soil's been used. You also need to be very careful when you're buying these days for the neonicotinoids. Those are the pesticides that have been in the news a lot. You want to make sure that that's not something you're putting into your body. Um, a question was asked in my last session of this workshop, uh, do, do neonicotinoids need to be labeled on plants? Do plants need to be labeled if it's being used? And I did research that question and no, they do not legally have to be labeled that way. Um, most of the bigger stores, uh, the big box stores and larger nurseries will label plants if neonicotinoids have been used. And the industry has gotten away from using them in the uh, plants that are used for consumption. You just have to make absolutely sure that those buying don't have it. Now, the pros to that is it saves time, it saves space. You know exactly what you're getting because the plant is there. You see the plant in front of you, much like the plants I have back here. I purchased those, I know what I'm getting. If it's supposed to be basil, then it is basil. Uh, as opposed to sometimes seeds come up and you're looking at it and you're thinking, oh, that's supposed to be basil and it looks a lot like sage, sticky fingers. Um, you have viable specimens. You're examining your plants. You know that they're alive. You know that they're doing well. You know that they're thriving. And there's a lot less labor involved. You do not have to constantly monitor them. Basically, you're buying it from the store and you're bringing it and putting it in your garden. So these are things you have to consider when you are choosing your plants. Companion planting. And when I say companion planting, I am talking about planting herbs with other plants so that they are favoring each other. Now, I went back there to get these two books. There is Carrots Love Tomatoes and Roses Love Garlic. These are definitely not the only books out there, but I happen to love them. They're, um, they're written by Louise Riate, uh, she's just brilliant. The books are enjoyable. They're also very easy to follow. Um, certain uh, herbs can be planted with other plants to help them. Now, garlic is an herb. And when you plant garlic with your roses, it does a couple of things. For some whatever reason, it makes the rose smell better. It, it really brings out that flavor. Maybe it's in comparison to the smell of garlic. I don't know. I happen to love the smell of garlic, so I don't know. But it also deters um, bugs from attacking your roses because, again, of the garlic, a lot of bugs don't like that smell. They will not go near it. So it's a deterrent there. There are so many different herbs that you can use in the garden that will do that. And again, I do have a list of some companion herbs that I can provide for you if you want to jot that down and send me an email. Um, 
they are used with vegetables. You can use basil with your tomatoes. The basil seems to enhance the growth of the tomatoes and the tomatoes seem to enhance the growth of basil. It also helps with cut down on the number of bugs that are attacking your tomato plants. Now, something um, that I discovered quite by accident many years ago, I was living at my aunt and uncle's house and my aunt and I went crazy growing gardens and we planted tomatoes and we planted peppers right next to the tomatoes because we like chili peppers and the chili peppers the entire plant has capsaicin in it and those chemicals leached from the chili peppers into the tomatoes and we did not know that we were making spaghetti sauce with our first batch of tomatoes and we tasted the spaghetti sauce and we're like wow this is really really spicy and we were blaming each other for putting the wrong thing in come to find out the tomatoes absorb that capsaicin from the pepper plants so when you are companion planting you're you're doing it to help the growth of the plants, but you also want to make sure you're not hindering the growth of the plants or changing the composition of the plant. That's why when we talk about containers and we're talking about chemicals leaching into your food plants or into your herbs, the plants will pick up the chemicals that are in the soil near them. So, you know, when you do containers, you don't want to use something that's going to leach chemicals. And when you do companion planting, you don't want to do something that's going to harm the plant. Um, English walnut trees or beech trees, um, they have a chemical in them that stops other things from growing around them, except for members of their own species. Black walnut trees will grow under black walnut trees. Pretty much nothing else will. Beech trees, it's very difficult to get something to grow under there because they produce a chemical. And I can't remember what that word is, but there is a word for it. Somebody's going to look that up for me. But uh, uh, if I don't want to say the wrong thing and put it in your brain, so let's not worry about that. Um, companion planting, they can complement both as far as being an insect repellent. They can complement as far as planting herbs with other flowers so that you can get a nice visual appeal, such as rosemary against rudbeckia, a purple flower with a yellow flower. As I said, they can protect. Uh, garlic is also good to use against fruit tree borers if you happen to be growing fruit trees. Um, mint near cabbage and tomatoes uh, will deter white cabbage moth and flea beetles. And no, the tomato does not pick up the flavor of the mint. Again, one of those crazy nature things. Um, borage. Borage is wonderful for uh, beneficial insects. Um, bees love borage. There are other plants that are wonderful for the bees too, but borage seems to be the absolute best one, so I, that's why I listed here. Herbs are a feast for the nose. If you have um, pads and you plant herbs alongside the pads, or you take some of the um, creeping versions of the herbs. There's creeping rosemary and creeping thyme, and you intersperse it on your pavers. When you walk past that, you're brushing those leaves and they are releasing their essential oils and you get that wonderful fragrance. You uh, can see me in a store with herbs. I'll just lightly run my hand over the herbs just because I want that, that wonderful fragrance of the herbs on my hands. Um, and again, it deters pests. If you uh, were to come over to my house in the summer, I have large pots growing with what looks like grass. It's lemongrass. Uh, lemongrass is wonderful for keeping away flies and mosquitoes and other bugs that'll bug you. Um, pennyroyal definitely keeps mosquitoes away. It's a member of the mint family. Peppermint can also repel those, you know, another member of the mint family. There are certain different things that can be used to keep the bugs away. Um, Scented geraniums are considered to be herbs, and they are different than the geraniums that we buy in the store, you know, those big bright, bright red flowers. Scented geraniums are wonderful. There's so many different scents to them, but they are also another thing I grow on my deck to keep the mosquitoes away uh, because that is what they are used for. So companion planting. Roses love garlic and carrots love tomatoes. Two wonderful books. Um, how to select your plants. 
<clears throat> you don't always want to pick the biggest and the tallest. Yes, the biggest is the best. That's what we all think. And the tallest makes it look like it's the strongest. But you have to be careful when you're picking them. Um, the tallest might have grown that way because they've been competing for light and they'll be spindly. They may be tall, but they'll be spindly. And by spindly, I mean uh, fewer leaves. So you want to be careful there. You also want to look at the roots. You should be able to remove your plant in one easy, I have this all set up, in one easy fell swoop. It should come out just like that, okay? And you should be able to set that plant in the ground. Um, when you remove it, as you saw, the potting soil didn't fall away. So there is a root system in there. The roots should almost fill the pot or the container uh, with loose fibrous growth. Now, if you look at this, you can just barely see the roots coming up. I don't, uh, hopefully you can see that okay. You can just see the roots coming up here. Now, if this were a root bound plant, I would score this or pull the roots out. You don't want to just plant it in this shape. You want to make sure that the roots aren't bound to each other. And that is called being root bound. Um, when they're root bound, if you let them grow like that, the roots will grow into themselves and it could strangle the plant. So always make sure if you're planting a new plant and it has those roots growing on the side, just take your garden trowel or a small serrated knife and just score it lightly to pull those roots down so that you have some roots growing out and the plant will then grow out. So make sure you're doing that. Make sure you're doing that with all your plants. Um, I do have a containers workshop next month and I'll be going into that more in detail. But um, even with your large trees, you wanna make sure that the roots are not spindling around because they need to grow out. If they're growing in this direction, they're going to continue growing that even if you take them out of the pot. You need to cut those roots down and you need to pull them out, tease them out as we say. Plant selection, still check the foliage. Leaves should be consistent, a strong color, usually green, but um, not necessarily. This is a variegated sage. Hopefully you can see this and the different colors in the leaves, but they are healthy leaves. They're, the green is very green. The white is very white. The plant is upright. It's a healthy plant. It, healthy, vibrant color, the next point. I don't have yellow leaves on this. They're not mottled. They don't look like there's a fungus growing on them. It's a healthy plant. Strong leaves, okay? There are new shoots coming up in here. And you also want to read the label. I'm not gonna pull it out because I'll get soil all over the place, but read the label so that you know what the size of your adult plant is going to be. Even if you're not planting in a container and you're planting out in the garden, you want to know that you're planting a sage plant here and it's not going to uh, you know, impact the growth of the tomato plant that's growing here. So sage plants generally grow to approximately six to 12 inches and they spread maybe about the same. You know, if you have a sage plant that's grown for a couple of years, you can have a pretty big bush. So you want to give that plant at least that foot of growth. And then you want to take into consideration the size of the tomato bush. Tomatoes grow vertically most of the time. They will spread out to probably about a foot and a half at most. So you want to make sure that you know, your sage isn't right here and they're competing. You want to plant the sage out here so that they can grow up and have enough light, air, and moisture. Okay, reading the label, um, not only to check the mature size of the plant, but you want to make sure that you're checking the requirements of the plant. So, you know, you're planting a plant that needs sun and a certain type of moisture as opposed to a plant that needs shade and lack of moisture. You want to make sure that the requirements of the plant that you're planting next to another plant are similar. You also want to think about soil moisture, which is what I was getting into. Some plants like a lot of moisture. 
Some plants like a lot of, uh, some plants like wet feet. They don't mind being wet. Other plants, if they have wet feet, they will not thrive. They will, you know, have problems. So you want to make sure that you're planting plants in containers um, with the same requirements. When you're doing containers, you want to make sure that you have clean potting mix. You don't want to be planting in a pot with moss or algae growing on the surface. Like you want fresh soil. You want a clean pot. If you have soil in there from last year and it's got moss or algae growing on the top, you don't want to just dig a hole and put your plant in there. That's causing other problems that you don't want to get involved in. Um, ask questions when you are buying your plants. Uh, when you go to the nursery, try to go at different times. Don't, I'm not saying don't go, but try not to go on the busy weekends or later at night after you've just gotten out of work. For some of us, that's the only thing we can do. But if you have the chance to go earlier in the morning or at the off times, try to find that guy or that woman that can give you the answers and looks like they know what they're talking about. Just because you go to the store and you ask a person doesn't necessarily mean that you're getting the correct information. When you get the information, double check it, come home, do your research, go online. We have ask an expert. We have a garden line. You can call us, you can call the master gardeners and we can answer your questions for you. There are a lot of different avenues for you to get expert information. And Look at it this way. You're investing money in these plants. You don't want to waste your money. You want to do everything you possibly can to do what you can for your plants to survive. Um, very important point eight, check for hitchhikers. And by that, we mean bugs that may be on the undersides of the leaves. You know, we all check the tops because we're looking down at the plant. Think about the plant and look under it. That's where a lot of those insects tend to be. Aphids love to be on the bottom. Scale, white fly, mealybugs, those uh, red spider mites, they all tend to be under there. Check the bottom of the plants and see if there's anything under there. Also, check the soil. See if there's anything wiggling around in there. See if you see any droppings or anything like that. Investigate your plants. Again, these are an investment. Even if you're just using them for a year, the plants are an investment. I mean, heck, you can take cuttings from those plants and bring them in and overwinter them. And then next year, you don't have to go and buy them. You've already got plants that you know are doing well. Um, requirements, I touched on that before. You want to make sure when you're planting plants in containers or next to each other that they have the same light requirements, water or moisture requirements, and what type of food they need, such as are they heavy feeders or light feeders. Herbs tend to do well without being bothered to too much about feeding, but some of them do require fertilizer. Um, light, are they full sun? Do they do better in shade? Do they prefer morning or afternoon? A lot of your little tags are going to give you that information. Water, do they want to be dry between waterings? A lot of the Mediterranean herbs do want to be dry between waterings. Um, too little or too much water, you, you've got to know that. By moisture, we are referring to humidity. Do the plants require misting? Do they require that they're dry at night? Um, what type of herbs are they? What region do they come from? North American herbs are different from Mediterranean herbs. The North American herbs tend to prefer shade. Mediterranean herbs prefer sun, you know, and the sand that I was talking about before. Temperature, <clears throat> you're talking about sun again. The bottom thing there, I talk about microclimates. Now, microclimates are things like you're going to plant in containers and you're going to put it on a deck. And when you put it on that deck, it's over the base of your house where the water uh, mark, it's called the watermark is, that concrete portion. Most of us have this painted a light color, which means the plant is here, the wall is here. The sun comes down here and it hits the plant, but it also hits that wall and bounces back and hits that plant again. So the plant is getting double light. Now for the Mediterranean herbs, that's wonderful because it's coming in and it's bouncing back and it's causing it to be a little bit warmer at night because now those walls have absorbed the heat and it's putting it back off. The temperature might be a little bit warmer here. 
So think about it. If you have a, an herb that does better in the shade, you don't want it there. That's what a microclimate is. Microclimates also happen in our backyards. Our backyards are not perfectly flat. They tend to dip or they go up. And if you've ever walked through your backyard or your front yard at night and you've gone into one of those dips, you feel that little bit of moisture or that little bit of coolness. Or if you've ever ridden a motorcycle, and you're driving at night and you're on a road and all of a sudden you dip down. And it's like, oh, there's this cool bit of air that's in a pocket. It feels wonderful in the middle of the summer. That is a microclimate. And for us, it's like a brief thing. For a plant that can't move, think about it. That's, that plant has to sit there in that microclimate. Is that where the plant wants to be? That's why we have frost sometimes in areas that tend to dip down. There's frost, but there's none up in the higher. That's because it's just a little bit colder down there. The last thing I'll cover on containers is drainage. And whenever I talk about drainage, I talk about the poor little banana tree. And the reason I say that, hopefully you can see my banana tree, one of them over here, is the way I learned my lesson about drainage was I had a banana tree and I'd always wanted one. And I was really happy when I got it and I planted it and I put the um, the piece of stone over the hole, you know, you're supposed to do that. That's what everybody tells you. And I put all these rocks in and the soil and I put the banana tree in. And as I was doing that and the tree was growing, I noticed that the leaves were yellow. And like I say to everybody, you know, we're master gardeners. We should know. I'm a master gardener. I know that when leaves turn yellow, it means the plant wants water. So I watered it some more. And the leaves got a little bit more yellow and I'm thinking, oh, it's really using up the water. So I put some more water in and I'm looking at the plant, it's not doing so well. And all of a sudden my little banana tree, literally as I was looking over it, boom. And when I went to check the plant out, it was because I had overwatered it and the water was stuck in the bottom. And I don't know if you've ever had a pot that has water stuck in the bottom, but it gets this fetid, disgusting, stench to it. It was terrible. And I was, I was heartbroken about my poor little banana tree. So drainage, good drainage is a must. The pot, if you're going to set a pot down, it's got to be on an open porous surface. That's why they put those little uh, things and you, the little legs that you put the pots on so it's lifted up so the water will drain through. Broken crockery or pebbles in the bottom, that doesn't really help with drainage. Yes, okay, it helps with drainage and it does, but it can clog the hole. And when the roots get down to those pebbles, they're hitting air. And when roots hit air, they dry up. So you've now taken a pot that's this deep and you put all this crockery or pebbles in the bottom and you've reduced it by that much. So you've reduced the growing area for those roots. One of the things that I discovered and it's wonderful to use, is over the holes you put tape. And this tape that you're seeing in front of you is drywall tape. Um, it's basically a nylon mesh, which you put over the drainage holes. It does not clog. It does not let soil out. It might let a little bit out, but it doesn't let a whole bunch out. And you have no drainage problems. And drywall tape comes in a huge roll. It's like this big. And I have reused my drywall tape. I just throw it in there and I soak it and I get all the soil off and it's clean for the next time I use it. I literally have the same roll of drainage tape that I've had since I became a master gardener back in 2009. It probably will get through this season, but I'm going to have to finally break down and buy another one. So it lasts a long time and they're only like, you know, seven, eight, nine bucks to buy a whole huge roll. Uh, it is probably the best way to deal with the whole drainage issue. Um, you can use other things, but you don't want to use something that might get stuck in that hole and that's not gonna drain so that the water gets stuck down in there because it will cause you problems that you don't want to use. Uh, a caveat here, if you're going to use something like a mesh, make sure that it is a nylon mesh and not a metal screening. I learned that the hard way on our new concrete patio. The water hits that metal screening, it rusts, 
And then as the water flows out, that rust goes onto the concrete patio. And let me tell you, it was not a happy time over here when those stains could not be removed from that patio. So be careful what you're using. Make sure it's nylon. Um, soil, not dirt. Uh, dirt is what you get off the ground, dirt. Soil is an organic medium, and there's different types of organic mediums that you're going to use for potting. There's potting mix, potting soil, there's sand, there's mulch, there's all different kinds, and what does it have in it? Potting mix is basically vermiculite or perlite, and potting mixes have a very little bit of soil in them, if any at all. Some potting mixes do not have soil. Now, a potting soil is predominantly soil with a little bit of per, per well, with a little bit of perlite or vermiculite. So, you know, you want to know what you're doing. If you're planting seeds, you're going to want a potting mix. If you're planting something that has delicate roots, like earlier we said the uh, herbs that do well rooting in water, you'd want to plant that first in a potting mix. It's light, it's airy, and those roots, which we're used to growing in water, will have no problem spreading out in there. If you use a soil, that's going to be a little bit more compact and those roots might have a hard time growing. And again, you want to do what's best for the plant. They're an investment. Um, just remember that all mediums are not the same. And as far as potting soils go, you can have, you know, a high-end potting soil that has a good mix of organic material, perlite and or vermiculite. It's light, it's airy, it's good for growing. A lot of the less expensive ones tend to put um, like uh, some type of oil into it to bulk it up and it makes it stick together. It also has that horrible smell so that if you're using them and it's going to go in your house, um, you know, you're going to grow herbs on the windowsill. You don't want that smell in your house. So make sure you're choosing a decent soil. And again, you're thinking about this because you're putting it into your body. So you want something decent that doesn't have additives in it. You don't want petrochemicals in it. So make sure you're checking out the soil that you're going to use. Okay, so herbal preparations, you can dry them, you can freeze them. And when you freeze them, you can freeze them in water. You can freeze them by themselves. You can just freeze the dried herbs. You can freeze them in oil and you can do them with butter. Um, when you're drying them, you can use a dehydrator or a flat screen. When you're freezing them, some herbs do better in oil than they do in water. Um, I tend to like using oil because you can use the cubes. If you do it in an ice cube tray, you can use the cubes and you can put the herb in the oil and then you can use it for cooking. Um, the easiest way to freeze herbs is just to spread them out, dry them. Once they're dry, you're going to freeze them overnight and then on a tray, and then you can put them into a Ziploc bag. Um, they store for months that way, uh, and they do really well. I have bags up in my freezer right now. Uh, for longer storage, you may want to think about doing it in the water. You can do it in broth. You can do it in oil. Um, and again, do it in an ice cube tray, and you can just drop that in whatever it is that you're cooking. Uh, why oil? There are some herbs that don't do well in water. When you freeze it in the water, it condenses the uh, leaves and it damages them and they wound, wind up getting freezer burn. The oil will not do that. It has give to it. Um, so you, you just, that's something you wanna do research on and you wanna look into herbal preparations. Um, again, if it's a workshop that you guys would like to cover for herbal preparations, please let me know at my uh, email address and I'd be happy to throw something together for that. Um, you can do herb flavored vinegars. These are wonderful. You can drop like rosemary into a vinegar and or thyme or oregano. Um, the thyme is wonderful on a uh, in a salad dressing. The oregano is wonderful when you are cooking, especially uh, pasta. Uh, all you do basically, you drop it in there and you let it steep. You can let it steep for, you know, a couple of days and you'll get a light flavor. It can go four to six weeks and you'll get a very heavy flavor. Um, pretty much you just have to do that at room temperature. You put the vinegar in, make sure it's corked and it's covered. You can use it for marinades. Uh, you can use it over vegetables, which is really wonderful. It really adds a new uh, level to your 
to your vegetables. And anything that's calling for vinegar or lemon juice, you can use an herb flavored vinegar. Herbal butters, you take the butter and let it soften. You chop up the herbs as fine as you can get them and you put it in. This is, I don't know if you've ever had Italian bread and you dip it in olive oil. You can do that same similar thing. A lot of times with the olive oil, they'll put salt, pepper, and like oregano or rosemary into that. You can do it with the butter and put a little bit of oregano or rosemary into the butter, mix that around, and then re-harden it in the um, refrigerator. Or if you want to store it, you can put it in the refrigerator. And then when you use it, you can either use it to butter your nice crusty loaf of Italian bread, or you can melt it over uh, things as you're cooking them. And it adds that extra flavor and it's already infused into the butter. Some people like lavender, um, lavender pastries or uh, lavender dishes are pretty wonderful if you do like the lavender flavor. You can also do that. Uh, lavender butter on scones uh, is really a nice treat. It's a very fresh treat. So yeah, uh, infusions, um, real quick. If you've ever made a cup of tea, you've done an infusion. Pretty much what you're doing is you are steeping the herbs in hot water, okay? So you would bring the water to a boil, let it sit covered up to 20 minutes. When you're making tea, it's gonna be three to five minutes. Depending on the flavor that you want, it can be you know longer than that. A decoction is basically a simmered tea. And that's the method that you'd use if you were doing bark or roots, um, you know, things like that. You put the herb in the water, you bring it to a boil, then you simmer it for 20 minutes. Now that is the difference. An infusion is you take boiling water off the heat and you pour the tea. You steep that up to 20 minutes. A decoction is you leave that boiling water on the heat source and let it simmer for an excess of 20 minutes, okay? And that's really pulling the flavor and the chemicals and the oils out of the herb. Now, a tincture is basically something that is done in using alcohol. And that second point there, all tinctures are extracts, but not all extracts are tinctures. Tinctures are concentrated herbal extracts, which use alcohol as the solvent. If you are using something else other than alcohol, it's called an extract. Now, these really aren't that hugely important, these definitions, unless you are going to go into these types of preparations. Then you need to know the difference between an infusion, an extraction, a tincture, and a decoction. Um, a lot of alcohols, uh, they like to use herbs in them now. Um, Crown Royal does uh, an apple flavored one. They do a lot with vodkas. So if they do it with vodkas, they advertise it as a vodka or, or an herbal infused vodka. Technically, it's not an infused vodka because they're not infusing it. They are doing a tincture, but they're not going to say that because it doesn't sound right. So it's an herbal infused vodka. But now you know the difference. Um, they do it in bourbons as well. They're starting to do it and they're doing different flavors. So um, yeah, so not a huge, huge, huge reason to know all these just for edification and just so you know what you're doing. So remember, if you're making a cup of tea, you are an infusionist. Oils, pretty much the same thing. Um, you can, pretty much the same thing as you can let the herbs steep in the vinegar and you can, but with them, you have to put them in the refrigerator and then you can use them in a couple of weeks. <clears throat> now, say you're cooking and you think to yourself, oh, you know what? I'd really like to use oil that has a flavor of an herb, but you didn't do it two or three weeks ago. You can still do that. About two tablespoons of crushed dried herbs to two cups of oil, let it sit there 
and then you are going to pour that into whatever the dish is that you want to use. So there are different ways to use it. With the method of a few weeks, that oil will have that definite flavor. With the preparation of the two cups of olive oil and two tablespoons, you know, an hour before you make dinner, you have to leave the herb in there so that the flavor is still in the food because the oil will not have time to pick up that flavor, just so that you know that. So today we've covered herbs, the disclaimer, this is not medical advice, was not meant to be and is not meant to be. A history, herbs versus spices, uses, different containers you can use, how to select plants, the requirements the plants may need, soil, and herbal preparations. Again, my email address is in the chat. It is themastergardener at comcast.net. Uh, if you have questions, if you want some of the handouts that I talked about, uh, we can send them over to you. Um, if you just want to chat about herbs, I'm more than happy to answer. Uh, just realize that we had a lot of people in this workshop. It might take me a day or two to get to all my, um, my uh, emails. So, um, so at this point, we can take questions. Um, Christine, did we have any in the chat? Uh, yes, we did. We had one from Michael. Since mint spread so much, would pots of mint around cabbages work to deter cabbage moths? Yes, absolutely, and it's a good question. Um, so if you have a flying insect that's going to bother your plants, yes, pots of mint would work. And when I'm, when I'm talking to you about planting out in the garden, I generally tell people that you wanna put mint into pots. If you're planting around the house, <clears throat> think about it, ants are in the soil, so the, they'll just go around the pots. The mint won't bother them at all. When you're planting around the house for like deterring ants or insects from getting in, that needs to be in the soil and you just need to weed it well. But in the garden, yes, absolutely. I have pots of mint all over, all through my garden. Good question. Any others? Yes, from Amy, do you have any suggestions for keeping mint from escaping containers? <laughs> Very tall containers so they can't grow down to the soil. Mint is a thug, absolutely. And it will do everything and anything it can to get into the soil. I planted it and had it up on the railing to my deck. And the following year, it was growing in the soil in the garden next to the deck. And what had happened was some of the mint had had their little flowers. I didn't pay attention. Those seeds dropped and now I have mint all through that garden, which isn't a real big problem for me because it's right next to the house and it tends to, you know, control the ants there. But yeah, uh, as far as what to do, cut the mint back before it flowers, if you have it in a container or before it actually reaches out of the pot and goes into the soil. Once it touches that soil, it will start sending roots out. And once you have mint established someplace, it is kind of difficult to get out. So just um, observation and making sure that you maintain the mint that's in the pot. Keep it, uh, keep it trimmed back in a neat mound and you should be okay. Okay, the next question came from Claire. How do you know if you have fusillium wilt and how do you get rid of it? Um, Carrie did provide and to talk about, um, you know, you could watch for symptoms and then you could coordinate with our plant diagnostic clinic to submit a sample. But do you have any other uh, advice for Claire? Fusillium wilt is nasty. Um, definitely what Carrie sent is awesome. For me personally, if I see a plant that has fusillium wilt, if it's affected the entire plant, um, one, I immediately isolate the plant. Two, I cut off anything that shows signs of fusillium wilt. Now, the other thing is you may not see it on leaves, but it may be there. So you have to be very careful. When I've cut it off of the plant, I always disinfect my cutting tools so that I don't go to something else and spread it. Um, a lot of times you're going to have to get rid of that particular plant. And when you do, do not compost it. You want that to go right in the trash, soil and all into the trash because that, uh, that organism lives in the soil as well. And the way it gets up on the leaves is water comes down and hits like rain or when you're watering from your garden hose, it hits the soil, it sprays up and it gets onto those bottom leaves and then your plant gets covered. So check out those um, resources that Carrie provided for you. Absolutely. Okay, the next one comes from Caitlin. 
what are the little flies around my indoor plants? Are they fruit flies? How do they get there and how do I get rid of them? Uh, without knowing exactly what's flying around, I, I don't know specifically if they're fruit flies or if they're gnats. Um, you can do a light oil spray. Uh, it's just pretty much like neem oil or something like that. I would take the plant outside, spray it down and bring it back in. Any dead or uh, decaying material that's around the plant, like if the leaves have dropped off into the soil, make sure that you're picking that up right away. Cut the dead leaves off the plant. Uh, take a fork or a little gardening fork that you may have. You want to rake that soil up and spray that with the oil as well. They lay their eggs down in there. And if you rake that up, you're disturbing the eggs so that they will not come to maturity. Um, other than that, the only thing that I can suggest is if it's a really bad problem on the plant and you want to keep the plant, you need to put it in a plastic bag and spray the heck out of it with, um, you know, a neem oil to kill those bugs that are in there. And as I said earlier, you want to check the underside of the leaves because they like to go under there. They're protected there. Okay, the next question, soil question, is there a ratio of potting soil to potting mix that works better or is it plant dependent? Plant dependent, definitely. Um, like I said, you have to evaluate everything that's going on with that specific plant. If it has delicate roots, you're going to want to use a mix uh, or possibly perlite or vermiculite until you get that plant established. Um, if it's, you know, like the one that I just showed you before that had a solid root ball that can go into a potting soil, no problem. Uh, any, any potting soil that you're going to use that's a decent potting soil is going to be okay for a plant like that. Um, from Barbara, we have a question around, will mint deter good bugs, butterflies, for instance? She has some planted near her milkweed. It should not. Mint is a low grower. It doesn't get all that tall, the milkweed will grow taller. So the milkweed should be fine by the, for the butterflies. The only concern that I would have is, I'm not sure what it is for the larval stage of the butterfly. So let me, uh, you said it was Barbara? Yes. Okay, so Barbara, if you're still on, if you could send me that question to my email address, I will get an answer. I honestly don't know with great authority what, it shouldn't bother the butterfly. I just don't know what it would do to the larval stage if they would be just indifferent to it or if it would affect them. So let me look into that question. She wants to grow mint and lavender from seeds, but she's having no luck. Is there something she can do to make them grow? Mint, um, when you grow mint, it's just basically, I sprinkle the seeds out on the soil and I just keep them misted until they finally start growing. Excuse me, don't put any soil on top of them. Just sprinkle them on top and just basically lightly rub them into the soil, but they need a lot of light to be able to uh, germinate. Lavender is a pain to grow from seed. It really is a difficult plant to grow from seed. It has to be, I think lavender is about an eighth of an inch and just very lightly cover it. And that's another one that just, it doesn't like to be wet, just spray it. It has to be sprayed like two or three times a day and it needs light to germinate. So both of them would do well having a light source that's close to them. Um, and I can tell you that lavender will not germinate unless there's a constant temperature of above 65 degrees. Um, but don't be discouraged by the lavender not growing from seed because I, I rarely have luck with lavender plants. <clears throat> They're better done from uh, clippings. Okay, the next question comes from Karen. Uh, she says, in Delaware, we have a bug called a spricket. Is there anything to deter those from coming into the house? Okay, I'm not specifically familiar with a bug named Spricket. That's more an IPM question, which I didn't really cover today. Um, you know, generally, 
general information is as far as, you know, not letting bugs into the house is make sure they're not on your plants when you bring them in. Make sure that the, any holes that are there in the screenings or around the windows or the doors are covered. Um, but as far as that, that's a specific IPM question. I would recommend that you call our garden line or you go to ask an expert and ask the question there. Okay, the next question is coming from Melody. How can we grow saffron? Uh, saffron growing, you have to get the correct crocus to grow it from. Um, and then if you want enough saffron, it is a large area that you have to cover intensively with crocus. Saffron, that's why saffron is so expensive. Growing the crocuses for saffron is labor intensive. It is, you need a lot of area to grow the crocuses and then you need, it has to be harvested by hand. There's no quick way to do it. Each plant gives you about two or three um, stigmas and you need about, I think it's 50 to 60 plants to get like an ounce. So yeah, if you have that room and you can grow that many crocuses, you're going to do really well as far as saffron production. But it's really something that I've never gone into because it's just way too labor intensive. So I just buy my saffron from the store. <laughs> okay, thank you. The, the next question we have is from Norma. Do you have any advice for starting rosemary? Um, when you say starting rosemary, do you mean from seed or? Uh, she doesn't say. Okay. So I, I mean from um, seed. Okay. So if you're starting from seed, again, um, rosemary is another one very similar to lavender. You want to um, make sure that you're covering it with only the slightest little bit of soil. It needs light and it needs constant warm temperature to germinate. Uh, rosemary is better done from propagation. And that would be, rosemary is one that does well with the, uh, uh, the water, the water propagation I showed you, or you can do a little bit of rooting hormone into a uh, little bit of soil and it should throw out roots from there. <clears throat> rosemary propagates really well. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next one comes from Patricia. Is there any companion plants that will deter stink bugs from tomato plants? I don't know specifically off the top of my head. I do have a companion planting handout that uh, Carrie said we can provide to you. So we'll do that as well. Um, I don't know that I have addressed stink bugs though in companion plants. That's something that I would look into those books for or I would um, Google that question, or I would go to ask an expert for that question. I don't have the information in front of me. Okay, and then we have two questions that are related, one's from Karen and one's from Anu, um, about the cats using either their vegetable garden or their raised beds as a litter box, and is there a way to keep them off, or is this going to cause problems for the plants? Okay, couple of things. Cats don't necessarily like mint, which sounds strange because catnip is a minty type of thing. They love catnip. They just don't really like mint all that much, most cats. <clears throat> um, what I can tell you is cats love, love carrots. It does weird things to different cats. Like they treat it almost like catnip. So if you have carrots in your garden, that might be something to consider. The other thing to consider is planting uh, pots of mint throughout the garden, which will deter the cats. And the third thing is a trick that my grandmother taught me. She used to call them, gosh, camouflage plants. And she would plant things in her garden or away from her garden to get the animals to go over there. So what I can recommend is furthest away from your property in an area that's not going to bother you too much, plant some catnip. Now, when you're doing it and you want to attract the cats, I don't know if you've heard of the old saying that if you don't want a cat to find your catnip, 
plant from seed. So in this case, you don't want to plant from seed. You want to buy a cup full of catnip plants and you want to plant them over there because as you handle the plants, the oils start coming off the leaves. You're going to invariably break a leaf or break a stem and that smell is going to get out and the cats are going to head over there. That's where they're going to do their, their business is over by the catnip because they want to be by the catnip. So um, you want to kind of do something to draw the cats away from the vegetable garden. The other thing that you can do is take plastic forks and push them into the ground around your plants with the tines sticking up. And when those tines start hitting, when the cats start hitting those tines and it bothers them, they can't do what they were meant to do. When they go to squat and you know it sticks them in the butt, they won't want to do whatever they're doing there. So those are my few recommendations for getting cats to stay out. Um, but mint is a good one. Oh, the other one, there are formulas for uh, making sprays out of like chili pepper, cayenne peppers, or you can even do it with Tabasco sauce. And you mix it with water and spray it on your plants. It doesn't affect the plants, but when the cats go over there and rub up against it, it burns their tongue. It doesn't harm them. It's just like us getting, you know, Tabasco sauce on her tongue, but cats don't understand what that is. All they understand is it burns. I don't want to be there. So they run away. And that is true for a lot of animals, rabbits, squirrels, even deer, uh, a capsation spray would work. Um, and you can, you can definitely Google that online and get a formula for that. Okay, we have one last question from Amy. Do you have a favorite homemade potting mix recipe? That's a tough question because I I do make my own, but I use commercial potting soils and potting mixes to make it. Um, I can tell you this, making your own potting soil is a daunting undertaking. I did try it once and you have to bake the soil. That's the first thing you have to do. And by baking, I mean, it needs to go in an oven. And I was not very popular around my house when I tried that because I don't know if you've ever smelled baking soil, but it's kind of gross. Uh, you need to dry it out. You need to kill the uh, bacteria that may be in it. And then you have to mix it with organic material and vermiculite and or perlite. So basically, I just use commercial potting soils or potting mixes. If I'm doing seedlings, I will use four parts of a potting soil to one part of vermiculite. I mix that in, I make sure it's nice, light and airy, and that's what I use to put my seeds in. So hopefully that did help answer your question, but I, I think that's more of an opinion question than what I would recommend for starting your seeds. Like it's what I, it's what I prefer. As far as starting your seeds, there's a ton of different ways you can do it. And I would just use, you know, a reputable potting soil and you should be good to go with that. And thank you everyone for taking the time to visit with us.